Well, thank you, Sam. I'm, I'm really pleased to be interacting by computer. This is all very, very difficult because of the pandemic, but I'm glad to participate. So I'm, a, I'm an old person now. I've been at Johns Hopkins for 50 years. It's gone fast. But I think about my time here, I, I don't feel so old because it was a really adventurous time. I think we have a wonderful campus with a great faculty and terrific students. And Hopkins has always had a large interest in, in medicine and health in general. And global health is, of course, a very, very important to, to us all. I'm sure all of the high school students around the country are living an experience now that they never expect, expected with the pandemic. So global health is not a, some kind of theoretical issue that might possibly happen. It's happening all around us. So I'm going to just give some reflections on my career as both a, a, a scientist, a medical doctor, and now as a director of a malaria research institute. And I'll go quickly because most of this is published. But I'm glad to answer questions if there are, are some at the end. So this is what I looked like when I started at Hopkins 50 years ago. August 1970, I arrived after spending a half a year backpacking through East Asia, Southeast, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, and across the Middle East. So I came to Johns Hopkins from Minnesota, my home state, by going west. And arrived at Hopkins with a lot of enthusiasm, but some trepidation. I had gone to a small college in Minnesota, and Hopkins was a big university. And I wondered if I would fit in, but I, I had a wonderful experience. I met students from all around the, the country, actually all around the world at Hopkins. And, in addition to the studies, I spent time in a research laboratory. And I found that very important. It really was uh, ex exciting to work in research as long, in addition to the clinical studies in medical school. So some years later, then I started my own laboratory and we were looking at red blood cells. Red cells, of course, are something that are easy to obtain because we can draw peripheral blood. And we're looking at their membranes studying what we thought was the, the rhesus blood group antigen, the RH blood group antigen, which is a very important issue in terms of transfusion compatibility, and particularly with RH negative women who become pregnant and have a RH positive baby. About 15% of our population is RH negative. So there's a good reason to study the RH, and we isolated a 32 kilodalton polypeptide shown in this electrophoresis lab. And the photograph is Brad Denker. Brad was a Hopkins undergraduate who went to medical school and worked in my lab for a year before joining Harvard for his fellowship. And so we isolated the 32 kilodalton polypeptide, which we confirmed was the RH core subunit. But there was a 28 kilodalton, slightly smaller protein that came along. And we thought it was a degradation product. It turned out to be a contaminant. So the story I'm going to tell you about the water channels started very humbly. It was a contaminant. It was very curious. So we pursued this really just out of curiosity and decided we'd clone it, clone it out of a cDNA library. And the coding ref frame we coded a 300, about 269 amino acid polypeptide with a lot of hydrophobicity in the predicted sequence. And it conformed with a bilayer spanning protein going through the membrane six times, as shown here. And this is, a, this is a characteristic of membrane channels. We didn't know what the function of this was. And so by talking to a lot of colleagues around the world, we compared the sequence with the DNA sequence bank at that time. And this is, this is a long time ago. This is 29 years ago. The DNA <coughs> genome biobanks had a relatively small number of proteins included, but there were several that were related to ours, none of which had a known function. So again, we'd isolated a complementary DNA group, ready to study its function, but really didn't have a clue what it, what, it, what it might do. But it was a suggestion of a colleague, former professor of mine, who su suggested that this protein is present in red blood cells and they're known to be osmotically very active. If you drop a, a drop of peripheral blood in, in a glass of fresh water or distilled water, red cells will burst, water enters the cells. 
drop a drop of blood from a finger prick into a, a glass filled with seawater, the cells will shrink. The water leaves the cells. So red cells are very water permeable, as are a number of other tissues, kidney tubules, secretory glands, the roots of planets. And the presence of our protein in some of those locations and related to proteins that, are, that were in the tissues of plants suggested that we had isolated the DNA for the a protein that was predicted to exist, but no one had ever demonstrated in, in isolation, and that was a, a membrane water channel. So how would you test the water transport? Well, we, we collaborated with friends at Johns Hopkins and were able to study it. So water, of course, in, in standing is not a dangerous place to be, but water at disequilibrium. For example, this tranquil Ar Arctic river that my son and I paddled one summer, we went through the rapids, it was a perilous, perilous place to be because of the energy which water shows when it's at disequilibrium. And the same would be true, of course, water in our bodies. Our tissues are filled with cells that are filled with water. But if, if water is at disequilibrium, like what would be in a freshwater drowning or after a closed head injury, it could be a very toxic substance. So testing the idea that this might be a water channel, we teamed up with Bill Gagino. Bill is the chairman of physiology here at Johns Hopkins, and this photograph is a recent picture of Bill, but he and I were both young scientists in, in our late 30s, and he was working on cystic fibrosis by studying the expression of the cystic fibrosis protein in the membranes of frog eggs. So on the left panel are two oocytes from frogs, one injected on the left with buffer alone and one on the right with a complementary RNA to our new, our, our new construct. So the idea is if the one on the right is a water channel, if we shift the, the oocytes from isotonic fluid into fresh water, the osmotic gradient should drive water into the cell and should swell and burst. And that's exactly what happened. When we transfer these from isotonic culture media to distilled water, the test oocyte on the right is swollen and exploded, producing much jubilation. This is Greg Preston, the postdoc who did these. I love this picture of Greg. I took it three years after the original discovery and he was still celebrating. I think that's the interesting thing about science. Very few people get rich because of science, but the, the discovery leads to new ideas and, and suddenly things connect that were always very difficult to, to manage, including the fluid transport throughout the human body. So basically what we have is a mechanism, and I'm gonna to try to use the pointer, two leaflets, the external and intracellular leaflets, and then the, the aquaporin, as we named this protein, protein inserted allowing water to go from the extracellular surface through the channel to the intracellular surface. And it does so in a very specific manner. Water moves as a, channel, as, a, as a column of water molecules of hydrogen and bonding between adjacent molecules. And in the very center is a repeat motif, which prevents hydrogen bonding between the upper water molecules and the lower water molecules. So there's, there's a gap here. And that's important because it prevents the movement of protons across the, the columns. So this water molecule moves down, binds to both of the the conserved asparagines and it's isolated from the column. So we were very interested in pursuing this, but as a medical doctor without a PhD in biophysics or molecular biology, we knew that we had to collaborate with others if we were going to make progress. And so the work I'm going to tell you about is collaboration with scientists all around the world. The structural studies were undertaken with a group in Switzerland and Japan. We established the localization of the protein in kidney in collaboration with Soren Nielsen from the University of Aarhus in Copenhagen. He was just a young scientist just out of medical school when he started these studies together. And he localized with great precision the aquaporin protein in renal proximal tubules. Now our kidneys are formed of about a million nephron units. And in your biology classes, you've probably studied about the, the glomerulus where filtration occurs. And then the primary urine moves into the proximal convoluted tubules and descending thin limbs of the leukopenemy. 
And I've highlighted this in green because this is exactly where the aquaporin-1 protein resides. And this is a compilation of membrane transport studies. So this is a logarithmic display, but it indicates that the proximal tubules, shown here and in green, have an enormous constitutive water permeability. When the primary urine then moves into the ascending thin limb and thick limb, there's negligible water permeability. And when emptied into the collecting ducts, water permeability appears, but it's controlled by antidiuretic hormone vasopressin. So our protein is in the proximal, but not the distal part of the kidney, suggesting that there must be another relative, another homolog in the collecting duct. So here's one of Soren's beautiful slides, a thin section of rat kidney from the outer medulla. And what you should see is a, here's a cross section of tangential cross section. Here's the primary urine in the lumen, the apical brush border, and it's stained with an antibody counterstained with peroxidase. So we're, we're, the color is goldish, gold color, or, or light brown. That indicates an enormous presence of the protein. And it's present as both the apical membrane as well as the lateral and the basal membranes. But it's not present in the collecting duct. I'm gonna to try to back up. So the collecting duct, this part, has no staining. Again, indicating there must be another member of the family at that location. So there is a, a lot of interest in this. Now, suddenly the whole idea of water entering and leaving tissues had a molecular explanation. Physiologists have been arguing about this for more than a century. And by simply being very lucky and very observant and collaborating, we were able to solve the problem. So the genetic pileup of the human repertoire, shown here, here's aquaporin one. And we, we named it when we were having, a, having beers together before the first public lecture. And before then, we called it channel-like integral protein of 28 kilodaltons. And the aquaporin name has stuck. So there are many relatives throughout nature. The human repertoire, shown here, are several which are water selective, and I'll tell you about a few of these. And there's an insect member here, or, or excuse me, a bacterial member, AQPC, I put in just for reference. And there's some that are permeated with water plus glycerol, which we term aquaglycerolporins. And again, there's another bacterial form here, glycerol facilitator. So why would we need 12 or so different water channel genes? And the answer is pretty interesting because special functions require special features to the channel. The water transport is not the only thing it does. So I mentioned that the collecting duct did not have the aquaporin-1 protein. And of course, soon after our original cloning paper, a group in Tokyo reported a cDNA, which we now refer to as aquaporin-2, which is present in the collecting ducts. And I've highlighted that in blue. And this is where water permeability is low unless the tissue is stimulated with antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. And that turns out to be pretty important. Every day we go back and forth between the, the baseline and the stimulated forms of collecting duct, renal collecting duct principal cells. So when we're thirsted, when we're hydrated, our collecting ducts look like this. If you look closely, you'll see some immunogol decoration, black dots representing immunoglobulin labeling of the aquaporin 2 protein and intercellular vesicles with rather little amount at the cell surface. When the isolated preps are stimulated with vasopressin, uh, antidiuretic hormone, the protein now relocalizes at the cell surface. The cartoon shows that. So it goes from an intracellular location when we're hydrated to a surface location when we're dehydrated. Because when we're dehydrated, we want to efficiently reabsorb more water through the cells, entering through aquaporin two and leaving through other aquaporins. So the collecting duct is more complicated takes two different aquaporins to enter and then to leave. But basically it allows us to recover water from the primary urine back into the bloodstream. Another member of the family, and this was cloned out some years before we got going on this study, but no one knew what the function was. And it was looked at by our former postdoctoral fellow, Masato Yasui, who came to our lab from Keio University in Tokyo. And he, he discovered that mutations in the gene the aquaporin gene expressed in the lens of eye leads to opacities. These are cataracts that are found in a small number of families that we identified genetically. So 
the protein in lens has a somewhat different function from in kidney, but defects cause pathology. Of course, we can treat cataracts with surgery. Another member of the family was present in brain, and we collaborated in these studies with Ole Petter Augerson. He was at the University of Oslo at the time. He's now the rector at the University, Medical University of Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. So brain has a special problem with water. Our brains cannot swell if they're injured. And so the aquaporin-4, as we call it, is present at the blood-brain barrier. So the model for capillaries and brain shown here, they're surrounded by these endothelia, these endothelia are surrounded by these, blocking the name for, to come to me in a moment. You can see in the electron micrograph of the presence the astroglial end feet, these foot processes around the basic memory, which allows water to move from capillary, capillaries and blood into the brain parenchyma. Now this is very important in situations of brain injury. This is a MRI for an individual with a, with a benign brain tumor causing some clinical symptoms. But when the images are weighted for the density of water, you can see that the tumor is large but it's surrounded by a huge swelling. And it's the swelling that was causing the pathology. When the tumor was removed, the brain expanded back to the normal formation, but the swelling took a long time to recover. And I, and I know about this patient very well because it was my, my, my wife, Mary, this was five years ago, but the removal of the brain tumor cured her of, of, of the problem and the edema eventually went away. But for others, they're not so lucky. Aquaporin-5 is present in secretory glands, and this is what allows us to sweat. This is a simple demonstration of a paw from a normal mouse on the left, and I've identified the functional sweat glands, and an aquaporin-5 null mouse, which we obtained from colleagues at the University of Cincinnati, where the sweat glands were present, but they were hypo hypofunctional. So this mouse would be unable to sweat when stimulated. You can imagine a human working in the hot sun not taking in enough fluid or not able to sweat would really succumb to hyperthermia. So this is an essential life process allowing us to cool ourselves. There are other members of the aquaporin family that are present in other tissues and are permeated by glycerol. On the far left, you can see fat tissue is aquaporin 7. And it's a, a subset of the aquaporins, which I mentioned, are permeated by water plus glycerol. So glycerol is released in fat during fasting and starvation. And it's taken up by the liver. So if you look at the far right panel, we see the liver hepatocytes decorated by immunofluorescence to identify the presence of aquaporin 9, which is upregulated during fasting. So it allows us to efficiently convert glycerol released from fat into the liver where it's converted back to glucose during fasting or starvation. Another and this is work of Jen Carberry, who was a postdoc. She's now a professor down at Duke University. Interestingly, the aquaglycerporins turned out to be also freely per permeated by arsenide. And arsenic, of course, is a toxin which causes terrific human suffering and is abundant in the rural parts of eastern India and Bangladesh. CM, I believe your family is from Bangladesh originally. So I'm sure some of your yeah, distant cousins in the out part more distant parts of Bangladesh face this problem of how to get pure water, because the surface water is oftentimes contaminated with cholera, but the groundwater is contaminated with arsenic. So the provision of pure water is an essential human right. One more I'll tell you about, and that's the aquaglycerporins in red cells. It turns out to be very important in malaria. And two of my colleagues involved in these studies, Nirbi Kumar and Dominique Pramanur, Glycerol permeates red cells through the plasma membrane, and then the malarial parasites reside within an inter intracellular vesicle, and they have their own aquaglycerporins, allowing the, the parasite to take glycerol from the plasma, grow and divide, and this is what causes the major problem in malaria. Here you see an individual red cell, here's another, infected with a single merozoic malarial parasite, and here's one where it's grown, divided, 32 daughter cells. And you can easily imagine this would rupture and release 32 infectious particles, which would infect 32 more cells, and there's a logarithmic expansion. 
So people with malaria have a horrific disease with hundreds of billions of parasites in their system causing terrific end organ damage. The mosquitoes, it turns out all life forms have aquaporins or aquaglycerporins. And mosquitoes have eight different aquaporins and it turned out to be very important during the balance of fluid after taking a blood meal. Female Anopheles mosquitoes, when biting a host, a human, think of a blood meal that would be rapidly extruding water using their aquaporin pathways as a plumbing system. And last but not least, plants. This is a slide I borrowed from Ralph Keltenhoff from the University of Würzburg. This is a small Arabidopsis. It's related to the mustard plant. Notice the foliage and the, and the arborization of rootlets. So an engineered form of this Arabidopsis, which reduced the expression of the rootlet aquaporins, also maintains normal stem turgor and foliage, but notice to do so, it has a huge arborization of the rootlets. So animals will compete for water, plants will compete also by sending out aquaporins and the plant on the, on the left would of course be at a great disadvantage in the rain stop because this plant would be much more efficient in taking up the water. So this was a happy day in my laboratory. It doesn't seem that long ago, it was actually 17 years ago. But the phone call came early in the morning informing me that I would share the Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Rod McKinnon, a colleague up at Rochester, at, 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 at the Rockefeller University in New York, who like myself as a medical doctor, and Rod studied ion channels. And the young people in the lab really came from all over the, all over the world and we had a great celebration. Here I am with my family in Stockholm getting the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And I show this because it often has a point of the two prizes, this and these people. And our families, our friends, really are the support that we need to pursue careers in medicine, science, or any other career. So I really was interested in global health. That's one of the reasons I came to Johns Hopkins in the beginning. I didn't think I had the ability to become a, some kind of a successful molecular biologist, but surprise, surprise, sometimes things work that you didn't, would never have predicted. But by being involved and trying, you can try new things. Nevertheless, I still have the, the, the sense I wanted to get involved in global health and was studying malaria aquaporins and was offered the directorship of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, a job which I hold to the, today. This is my starting my 14th year as director. I'll step back in January, become an emeritus professor and have more free time. But we're studying malaria abroad. I, I thought I would share some of these slides with you, even though I'm probably eating up my question time. We're based in Zambia, in Southern Africa, because most of the world's malaria and most of the mortality is in Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. About a half a million children will die of malaria every year, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. But malaria is also present in Bangladesh, India, Southeast Asia, and in the Amazon. But our work in Zambia, I have photographs I've taken that I'd like to share with you. The Zambia is a, a nice country, but it's a poor country. And infectious diseases like malaria are, are really a problem. And of course, the disease, as I mentioned, affects the children of Africa. These little boys that live outside our field station in Macha in southern Zambia are not from poor families, by rural African standards. Most of them have shoes. They all have relatively clean clothing. They go to school, they're ter taken care of, and they're protected from malaria with bed nets. Here's my hero, Phil Tuma, the pediatrician on the left. He grew up in Zambia. His father was a medical missionary, and after coming to the United States for medical school and residency in pediatrics at Johns Hopkins, he returned to Zambia, where he's led a hospital, and adjacent to that hospital, we have a research institute. So here's a little boy that did come down with malaria, but has recovered. But here's another little boy that was not so fortunate. He noticed his disconjugate gaze. He was brought to the hospital comatose, near death with cerebral malaria, which causes tremendous swelling in the brain. And I talked to you about the aquaporin-4 pathway in brain. His life was saved, but he never was able to recover his vision. He's got the disconjugate gaze because he has cortical blindness. 
So when we hear the statistics that half a million children die of malaria, it doesn't reveal the even more horrific statistics that many million are left with permanent brain damage, kidney damage, lung damage. And so it's still a, a huge problem. The coronavirus epidemic we have now is causing loss of life, but malaria causes loss of life every year and is expected now to be harder to control because of the reduced presence of the, the, the health system. So here I am with our, our team in Southern Zambia, young men and women working very hard to knock out malaria in their homeland. And here's the, one of the, the logos from the side of our research vehicle. And you can see on this graph, Phil Tuma's compilation of success working in the Macha Hospital, a, a rural hospital in Southern Zambia. This is before the introduction of the artemisinins, the current medication, the, the wonder drug for malaria, which, for which Tu Yuyu won the Nobel Prize in medicine recently. After the introduction of combination artemisinin, the problem went down, but the third year after it was introduced, this drug stockhouse made artemisinin less available and the, the, the disease returned, but with replenishment of the artemisinin and an introduction of the insecticide treated bed nets, the malaria burden was reduced still further. So it's, it's gone from 100 deaths and 1,000 hospitalizations a year down to two or three deaths. And some years we've had no deaths in the Macha region, but it's recently returned and we're afraid that there's gonna be a restoration. So it's clear to us we can't stop our work or the disease will rebound. So malaria is a seasonal disease. Here's, here's matcha, the surrounding countryside in September. And here it is in October when the monsoons, the, the, the rains come. Zambia turns green, it's, it's, a, it's a paradise. Flowers are blooming, butterflies are flying, but when the rains return, the mosquitoes return. And that's when malaria re returns to, to the, Zambian rural area. And getting out to do our field work is quite a challenge, as you can see. Uh, the roads don't all have bridges and they're not, many of them paved. And the people that are suffering from malaria are those that live in the rural countryside. So here's the path to one village at the beginning of the rainy season. After a couple of months, the grass will be two meters tall. So getting there, getting out is not easy. But there, in, the rural outback, I, I think the last innocent people on the planet, the subsistence farmers and their families, raising maize, that's corn, and basically subsiding, having enough to feed the family, children can go to school, but when they're struck with malaria, it comes to a grinding halt. So here's Harry Hamapumbu, one of our team workers, screening families, that had a child that came down with malaria looking for carriers. Because many of the older people who've had malaria many times carry low levels of the parasite and immune balance. So they're the source of the parasite when the rains return. They, they're not smiling, but they're, they're not used to having Western visitors. So they're very grateful. So by our standards, these people lead very primitive lives. Their children, none of their children have electronic toys. They're like, lucky if they have electricity at, at, at all, because most don't. And they use primitive methods for, our, for agriculture to raise the crops which they survive on. But they're, and everybody works. The adults will work. The children work. The older children take care of the younger children and carry the maize to the village for, for having it ground in the cornmeal. But they also know how to have fun. You don't have to have complex computer systems to have a good time. <coughs> Pardon me. So here's some children that we, we, we visited that seemed just delighted to have it. And here's a family. And I think another feature of the people that live in rural Africa is that they have such great respect for their children. They treasure their children. That's their most precious possession. 
and all the resources go into the children and their education to make the world a better place. But it's, it's a challenge. Most of the places have, people have to go some distance to get drinking water. So it's, it's a hard life, but it's, it's something that we, we ha have to accept and we have to help. So this is the Macha Hospital that our team has worked adjacent to. This was built by Phil Tuma's father about 70 years ago. So that was Zambia. Next to Zambia is Zimbabwe. And these two were the former colony known as Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. Zimbabwe has had a, a more difficult role since independence because of the, the government. So this is the colonial bridge at Victoria Falls separating Zimbabwe on the left, from, excuse me, Zambia on the left from Zimbabwe on the right. One difference is Zambia at independence had a liberal democracy. Zimbabwe was led by Robert Mugabe, one of the liberators of the country, but he did not adhere to the democratic system and retained power for 35 years. You can imagine with unbalanced power for 35 years, corruption will emerge. And it did so and it ruined the economy. And Zimbabwe has never recovered. It was once one of the richest countries in Africa. So how can you do research in a place like Zimbabwe, which is basically a police state? And here, here you have to be a little relaxed. I think a little Machiavellianism is probably not a bad thing. We're partnering in our work in Zimbabwe with a, a not-for-profit organization called the Biomedical Research Training Center. And the vice director was Shungu Minati, whose picture I'm being taken with. Shungu Minati is one of the relatives of Robert Mugabe. So in a sense, having her on our team gave us the permission to do our work. And we were not there to validate the Mugabe government. Mugabe has now left power. He died last year. But the, the new leader of the country is just as bad. But we, we can't, we're not there for political reasons. We're not there sent by the CIA. We're there to do health research. And as I said, Zimbabwe was one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. Here's a Tia state in Eastern Zim. And where they have states like this, of course, the, the workers have paid jobs and life is pretty reasonable, but it's still very simple by our standards. Basically, people are living lives like you might have a summer camp. It depended on the rivers for washing, for the water supply, for religious celebrations. And the, priv the prized possession of these families are the children. Here are two little Zimbabwean children on their way to school. And this is an older fellow, he's about, about my age now, probably a grandfather. And I, I talked to him, and he was in his Sunday finest. He was so grateful that the, the, the efforts were eliminating malaria in his district. And here, the workers at one of the regional health centers had asked, actually, the lady in pink in the, the second from the left, how long she'd been on duty at St. Peter's Clinic. This is in Eastern Zimbabwe on the border of Mozambique. And she didn't understand, I meant like since eight o'clock this morning, she said she'd been on duty for the last 25 years. They have extremely dedicated personnel and they're well-trained, but the facilities need replenishment. And I think together we've accomplished some very successful efforts to reduce the burden of malaria in eastern Zimbabwe. But here's a clinic in the morning in the rainy season. Several young mothers are bringing their children in with malarial fevers to be treated. So there's still much more work to do. And, and this photograph I find very inspirational. On the left with his thumb is my dear friend, Sungano Marakura. Sungano grew up in a village in Zim. He was one of the children with a stick herding the cattle. He was very good in school and won a scholarship to the University of Zimbabwe in Harare. And he was a standout student there and won a scholarship to Oxford University in England and did a PhD and a postdoctoral fellowship. And rather than joining a European pharmaceutical company at a big salary, he, he wanted to return to Africa to knock out malaria. 
and he's doing that. He's our colleague in Eastern Zimbabwe. He's now the dean of the Africa University there, and his primary objective is to eliminate malaria. So in closing, I'd like to just share a, a little wisdom from, from the East. Some of you may speak Mandarin, and we realize that the, the, the Chinese word for crisis is actually two characters. Wei, time of danger, Ji, a time of opportunity. And I, I think that's what we have in global health, a time of danger. Right now we're in a time of danger because of the coronavirus. The malaria will still be there, as will TB and many other infectious diseases. But this is also our opportunity to use our scientific training and our motivation to change the world. So with that, I, I'd like to end. I'm a little over time and I apologize for that. But those of you who've been at Hopkins know this is the dome of our hospital at the end of the day. And at the end of our careers, I think you think back about all the things we've done. I think interacting with the people around the world is one of the most gratifying parts of a career in medical science. And with that, I hope I've interested you in what might lie ahead for your career. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them and see them and, and your, your colleagues. I, very grateful and I hope once we get rid of this pandemic, as my five-year-old granddaughter says, this ridiculous virus, we can all get together. Thank you so much, Dr. Agri. It's an amazing presentation. Uh, we'll now be shifting into our question and answer session, uh, moderated by some of our conference directors. So I think Ramila will give us our first question. Uh, yes, so Laya Bent from Toronto, Canada asks, in your noble lecture, you mentioned that the initial discovery of aquaporin-1 was by sheer blind luck. How much of science do you think is luck-based, and how do you distinguish between experimental errors and unexpected discoveries? Well, I, I think serendip, luck is probably there in most discoveries. I mean, a lot of these systems are very complex. I, I, I sometimes oversimplify things. It's not like we just bumped into it and was a contaminant and took a lot of effort, a lot of personal contacts to talk to people with ideas that what it might do. So I, I, I think it is a combination of luck, having very smart and well-informed colleagues and, and a lot of hard work. The second question was how do you, it has to do with experimental error? Could you restate that please? Yeah. It was, so the second part of it was, how do you distinguish between experimental errors and unexpected discoveries? Yeah, that's, a, that's the question. And the unexpected discoveries are oftentimes not very important. So this, this young person in Toronto, I congratulate him or, or her. One of my sons-in-law is actually from Toronto. They've got great science there. That's where insulin was discovered. And I think it's not always obvious. When you get an unexpected result, you need to be confident in your technique. It should not be due to sloppiness. Sloppiness is a real problem because it slows you way down. If you can operate efficiently and cleanly and get clean results, you can move on. Now, the question is when you, you're you're studying the Rh blood group antigen and you find another protein almost the same size, contaminates it, what, what do you do? You probably don't have enough time to study both in depth. So really we pursued the Rh protein, but a little bit of time we reserved working on evenings and weekends. I didn't feel that I was cheating the funding agencies to work on this unknown protein. And in fact, when we established it was a water channel, no one in the lab wanted to work on RH anymore. We, we got so much attention that I, I, I could hardly concentrate. So it, it is a challenge and I think you need all your resources and don't be afraid to share this with, with colleagues. If we had not shared openly with this protein and we shared pretty much ever since, we would have made much less progress. Of course, there's a risk that you'll give away the 
the study and someone else will scoop you. But there's a moral high road in science. And I think by working hard, you can establish it and credit is oftentimes not so glorious. Most people don't win Nobel Prizes, but some of us did. You might. Is there another question, please? Uh, yes. Hi, Dr. Um, Agar, um, thank you so much for your um, presentation. Um, so this next question was asked um, by multiple students, a similar form of it. So medicine and research, they're both very taxing, but also at the same time, very rewarding careers. So as a physician scientist yourself, how did you seem to find the balance between the two? Well, I, I, I loved both, but I, I felt I was, I, I didn't expect to have any talents in the laboratory. It was my roommate in med school, Van Bennett, a chemistry student from Stanford, who got me interested in trying some things in the lab in the first place. And I, I found that just very exciting to be able to make progress on a laboratory bench on a problem. And it comes down to, as a physician, you can take care of one person at a time. As a research scientist, you might lead to a discovery that helps a million people. So it, there are different lives, but you can have both in academic medicine. And sooner or later, one will be of higher priority than the other. But I think they both are rewarding and we need both. And I think that interface between clinical medicine and basic science is, is a very exciting place to be. We still don't understand most of the diseases that our patients have. We understand it at one level, but suddenly something new is found and it makes perfect sense. I hope I answered the question. It's, it's, it's not like we should all do one or all do the other. I think we need to do what follow your heart. If you find laboratory work, uninteresting and you need more reward, more success, it might not be the career for you. On the other hand, uh, making a discovery is like going fishing for the first time and catching a big fish. It's hard not to get excited. Um, thank you, Dr. Agre, for that excellent answer. So our next question is from Geetanjali Alapati from Alabama, and she asks, how effective do you believe our present interventions against malaria are, and when do you think we will be able to achieve com complete eradication of this disease? Well, there's been tremendous progress. The United States has no endemic malaria. There are a few cases every year that people bring back from abroad and they're diagnosed and they're treated. But at the end of the Civil War, 150 years ago, malaria was rampant throughout the southeastern United States and the Midwest, up, up to the Great Lakes regions, even in Canada. And by public health measures, they were able to reduce the burden by accurately diagnosing and treating. And in the beginning, the treatment was quinine. We didn't have the good medicines. And also construction practices, building the houses away from the damp and swampy areas, putting screened windows, and even the screen door helped. The CDC, which we hear so much about, was found, founded with the, the purpose of being a malaria control center in Atlanta, Georgia. So we got rid of it. And we're a rich country. Cuba, after the revolution, still had malaria. And they were a poor country. But by employing public health measures, they were able to eliminate malaria from Cuba. And Haiti, which is only 30 miles east of Cuba, has malaria. So I think it's, it's a feasible achievement. But when you look at the grand scale of things like Africa is it, an enormous undertaking. I mean, Congo alone is one and a half times as big as Alaska. There are a billion people in Africa, and many of them are the poorest in the world. So I, it, it will not be a simple undertaking. It will require economic lifting of these countries as well. But I, it, it will not be achieved in my lifetime, but it might be in your lifetime. When I was a medical student, they, had the last case of smallpox. D.A. Henderson from Johns Hopkins, who worked with both the 
World Health Organization and the CDC led the effort to eradicate smallpox. We were close to eradicating polio, but when problems like the coronavirus pandemic emerged, people are afraid to go to the clinic and some of these infectious diseases are gonna get worse. We expect malaria will be much worse. Thank you so much for sharing your unique perspective and insight with us um, well, about that. You go to a great medical school down there in Birmingham. Okay, so we have a, another question from, we have a question from Jay Luo, who is an incoming freshman at Hopkins from Vancouver. And he asks, in your view, what has been the biggest factor for your success in your career? Well, I, I came from a family, my, uh, science was was valued a lot. My dad was a chemistry professor at a small Norwegian college in Minnesota. So, so I grew up with the idea of science as a possible career. And he, he encouraged me and, and two of my brothers to go into medicine, so we're all doctors. I think as a medical student, I, I had the great fortune of making friends with my friend Van Bennett, who I told you about, who steered me to the lab. And I also fell in love with a young lady here in Baltimore, who, who's my wife, Mary. We've been married 45 years. And she was very patient and supporting, supported me all along. You can clearly make more money doing something other than medical research, but I think all of those factors were important. And, and as you, you realize, these are the human factors. I think, uh, they're every bit as important as anything else. That plus an opportunity, you can do great things. But without the support structure, if you're in an unfortunate conflict-ridden marriage or you have other problems, uh, it, it's hard to concentrate on the research. But I, I think the, the human support was pretty much the most important factor. And so that's why I oftentimes refer to the two prizes of Nobel as one and having a wonderful supportive family is the other. So people often ask me, well, how many of my four children went into science and medicine? <laughs> the answer is zero. <laughs> they followed their passions elsewhere. I don't think everybody has to be a medical scientist. My daughter, Sarah, is really loves the outdoors and she's a market, senior marketing specialist for North Face Outdoor Wear. There's a beautiful little baby boy and they live in Denver. Her daughter Claire is a landscape architect. She's designing the Governor's Island Park in New York City, bringing green space to cities. My son Clark is he's a public defense lawyer who worked out in Louisiana, so the Louisiana for six years. He's now returned to Maryland where he's defending Poor people who've been arrested. Our daughter Carly is a healthcare social worker in Philadelphia, and she's the one who married a Canadian. And so they're all following their passions. And, and Mary is, she was a laboratory worker when I met her. And with children, she stayed at home for a few years and became a preschool teacher. So she takes care of us all. Um, thank you, Dr. Augrave. So we do have one last question for today, and it's from Aditya from Pennsylvania, and he asks, in your pursuit of discovering the aquaporin-1 and combating malaria abroad, what challenges did you face and how did you overcome them? Well, there were lots of challenges, but I didn't have to worry about supporting my family because I had grants that generated the lab support and provided a, a salary. And I, I didn't have a family that was needing ex expensive vacations. Our, our usual vacation was camping in a tent. And that's one of the stories of how we first conceived of the idea that this 28 kilodalton protein was the water channel. It was after a camping trip to the Everglades, and we stopped over at Disney World. We passed through Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where our colleague had and worked at the university and it was that conversation that first suggested it was a water channel. So things worked out fine. I felt I was in the right place at the right time with a great support team and a, a hot idea. Well, thank you so much. Um, with that, I guess we'll be concluding Dr. Aubrey's presentation and question and answer session at the 2020 Global Health Leaders Conference. 
Uh, on behalf of our conference board and the students in our program, uh, thank you so much for speaking at our conference and for all you do. Uh, you're an incredible person and an amazing role model for all of us, uh, and we really appreciate it. Well, you're so kind to invite me. I enjoyed this much, and I, I sincerely hope I, within a few months we, we, we can get together. We may have to still wear masks. Good luck to you. Yeah, I probably. Hope you, hope you all win Nobel Prizes. And if you don't, <laughs> you'll still have a great career. <laughs>